think uh, we should start at 6 uh, a.m. Central Time here. And uh, hello and welcome everybody on today's webinars. I'm really delighted to be um, uh, the acting uh, opening act of today's webinar uh, on um, uh, sexual uh, toys, wearable devices, and appliances uh, for sexual pleasure. And from a global perspective, um, my name is Dr. Omar Rahim. I'm a urologist at the University of Chicago and uh, also the ISSM webinar um, uh, series uh, from ISSM. It's really extreme pleasure to uh, welcome you all uh, today um, and uh, introduce this topic. This topic has been really uh, one of the, uh, the most uh, registered so far. We have over 600 registrants uh, for this webinar today. Uh, very exciting to hear from a very wonderful um, speakers um, from all around the world uh, and moderators on this uh, very exciting topic. Next slide. So I wanna just also mention for the audience that uh, we have a new feature uh, where you're able to uh, listen and uh, read the subtitles. Uh, it's gonna be um, all uh, translated to a language of your choice. Uh, just by choosing your language, you can uh, see the translation from English to, uh, to your uh, uh, desired language. So uh, this is a, a new feature that we wanna provide to you so make it easier for you to understand the, the webinar and maybe be more, more active, interactive with us. Next slide. I also want to mention that uh, that um, mission and purpose is stated in this slide. Uh, we want to be uh, the most trustful uh, and uh, resourceful information to uh, uh, people around the world, uh, providers and patients. And because uh, we believe that um, every human being has the right to be a healthy and satisfying uh, sexual life. Um, ISSM has been around since 1982 for the last 42 years. Uh, the ISSM has been very active in different areas and providing really the highest information uh, in terms of education to the whole field of human sexuality. Again, as the mission is to be really the most respectful and trustworthy uh, source of information uh, that provide education uh, to um, uh, uh, doctors and patients um, uh, around the world. Uh, and we do that through different, uh, different ways. And one of them is today's webinar, uh, which, which you'll see um, again, from the content and from the speakers, uh, we really make an effort to provide this highest information to you um, uh, in, the, in these uh, selected topics. Next slide. Uh, ISSM has uh, seven affiliated uh, societies around the world. Uh, you can see from this map, uh, each, each society um, representing a region of the world and providing really high information to the, uh, to the local um, uh, providers and patients. Uh, in terms of sexual information and health information. Um, uh, but the ISSM really, um, uh, uh, really uh, really a mission and purpose is to uh, interact with all the societies and, and provide a platform where which, where which that uh, we can interact and exchange information and again to provide the highest information um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the masses. Um, so we'll be very active in, in liaising all this activities. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, we do this, uh, our mission really of education uh, is done through a series of obviously different educational platforms, uh, certainly the virtual one. But today, for example, uh, we have over 600 registrant. Uh, this is a, a testimony of the, of the work that we do in, in, in this arena, but that's not enough. We have four uh, flagship journals. Uh, the top one is Journal of Sexual Medicine, uh, Impact Fatal 3.9, uh, provides really the uh, uh, the most evolving and updated uh, uh, science and basic science and clinical information uh, in, 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 uh, to, to doctors and patients. Uh, the second journal is Sexual Medicine Open Access, also provide um, really uh, very important uh, uh, basic science as well as clinical information. And we have also Sexual Medicine Reviews, which is a journal that's highest impact factor of 5.3, uh, uh, and again, providing really uh, wonderful reviews uh, uh, pertaining to sexual uh, health. And lastly, we have the video journal Personal Urology. This is a journal that's specific um, published uh, video journals uh, or video articles of surgical techniques uh, that the surgeons uses to address uh, uh, sexual problems um, in, in, uh, in, in um, different genders. 
Today's today webinar will be uh, uh, moderated by two wonderful uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Estella Stern from Uruguay and Dr. Uh, and Nagina Kuskad uh, from uh, Texas. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Kuskad first. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist and educator and founder of Texas uh, Sexual Health in North Texas, USA. Uh, she has doctorate in human sexuality uh, from Institute of Advanced Studies in Human Sexuality from uh, California. She also has doctorate in business administration from Argozi University in Illinois. And also she has a postdoctoral studies in neuroscience from Emory University. She uh, also carries MBA from American uh, University in Puerto Rico. Um, she is a founder uh, of, uh, again, of the uh, Texas Sexual Health uh, and is a member of, um, of the ISSM Educational Committee, uh, also a member of the World Association of Sexual Health. She's ambassador of American Sexual Health Association and vice president of the Hispanic leaders in USA. Um, she works uh, on multiple arenas. She has multiple uh, publications. She, uh, I believe she has a new book coming up this year called Late Life Virginity. Uh, I'm very excited to read this book, uh, Dr. Kuskat. So thank you for being here. And, and also we have Dr. Estella Stern. Dr. Um, Stern, uh, she's an obstetrician gynecologist from Uruguay. She's, um, uh, she's a diplomat or uh, she has diploma from University of uh, Montevideo in Uruguay. She's a follow of the, of the European Committee of Sexual Medicine. And also she's the president of the Uruguayan Society of Sexual Medicine. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Stern first to uh, introduce the speakers and I'm very excited to hear uh, your moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Welcome everybody. Uh, we are very excited to be here in this morning, morning from here in Uruguay in Montevideo. And it's my pleasure, please, uh, can I have next slide, please? It, uh, this is the program that we will have in. We will hear first Dr. Amy Perlman talking about sex toys, wearable devices, and appliance for sexual uh, pleasure. Then we will turn over to Dr. Arnold Rudolf for continental variations in sexual sex toys, causes, and future perspectives. It's important to note that we will have a QA and a session after the whole webinar finished, and please pose your questions in the Q&A uh, section so that we can, Dr. Tanji and I can uh, see them and hand it over to the, to the speakers. This webinar will be recorded and you will be able to find it later on on the ISSM wave page. So maybe we can turn now to Dr. Amy Perman. Let me introduce her. She is a board certified urologist fellowship trained in men's health and genital urinary uh, re reconstruction. Sorry about that. She earned her medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine, complete urology residency trained at the University of Pennsylvania, fellow of Wake Forest, and was director of the men's health program at the University of Ohio before recently relocating to South Florida to co-found Prime Institute. So Dr. Perman, we are happy to have you. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, hey folks. So I'm coming at you from South Florida. I'll give you a little, little tour here. And I'm gonna step inside as a golf cart comes around. So I wanna start off by telling you a story now, my parents were recently in, they were out gallivanting in Europe. And so I was watching their house while they were away for two weeks. And something happened the other day when I was at the clubhouse getting breakfast. So I'm grabbing a bagel and there are three men sitting at a table nearby and they wave me over. And one of them I recognize, one of them is a friend of my parents uh, who I've met before. And so I walk over to the table and these guys are in their seventies and eighties, two of them I hadn't met before. And we somehow, you know, they asked, are you the urologist daughter? So I said, yes, of course. And then somehow our conversation morphed into um, sexual health, female anatomy, and why every couple needs a sex toy, including a vibrator. And even at a clubhouse in South Florida with, you know, my parents' friends at the table, I have not yet been reported to the homeowners association. And in fact, they were interested by this conversation that I'm meeting with one of those guys tomorrow to figure out a lecture, a lectureship series 
for his group of 60 golfers, uh, male golfers. So you can bet that one of those uh, lectures is going to be why every golfer in South Florida needs to get a sex toy. And if I can tie that uh, improving sexual health into improving one's golf game, I think I'm going to make major changes here in the South Florida area. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. And importantly, one of these disclosures is FirmTech. I am going to touch briefly on this device. It is a wearable penile constriction band that provides us with information in real time on erectile fitness. Next slide, please. I am going to show a lot of pictures during my presentation, but I do want to make clear that these are just examples and they are not endorsements of specific products. Next slide. So the terminology is changing, and oftentimes we hear that word uh, sex toys. Advance, please. But marketing strategies are changing all the time. And we oftentimes, when we think about sex toys, we think of pornography. And that's why in many respects, this topic is very taboo. But these pornographic images that are associated with sexual wellness are actually now being rebranded, which is very exciting, as simply a healthy means of improving one's sex life. Next slide. The sexual wellness market is ginormous. 80 billion US dollars in 2021, next. And the growth is expected to go up to 112 billion by 2030. So we know when it comes to this overarching, overarching sexual wellness market, it is huge. People are interested, patients are interested, and healthcare providers also need to be interested. Now, underneath this sexual wellness market is the sex toy market, also a huge market, estimated to be $35 billion in 2023, and it is nearly going to double by 2030. Now, key factors driving this market growth include a demand from customers to enhance their sexual experience, not just related to porn, liberalization, social media, and the influence of pop culture. And this increase in popularity of sex toys has been observed around the world. Women, couples are experimenting with sex toys, and they're also known to have medical benefits. So even more than just improving pleasure, they can help within the medical space. People or, or women who have menopausal symptoms and neurological conditions can benefit. And in men, more and more products are coming out to tackle sexual problems like premature ejaculation, lack of libido, and erectile dysfunction. And we look at where these products are coming from and, and how people actually get access to these products. Most of it is through, uh, go back a slide, please. Most of it's through e-commerce. Um, oftentimes we think of these seedy sex toy stores where we might recommend our patients go, or maybe we've gone into them before, um, but that's actually not the majority of the market these days. And so with e-commerce, it allows a lot of people access to these products out of the comfort of their home. Next slide. When it comes to globalization of the sex toy market, North America currently holds uh, the greatest share. So about one third of the market comes from North America. But um, according to a survey in 2019, over 50% of Americans have used sex toys to improve their sexual experience. But these are very popular around the world and European countries are also a leading contribute to, contributor to the market. Traditional vibrators and dildos are actually the most popular products in these countries. And you can see here in terms of the fastest growing market, Asia Pacific is actually expected to register the fastest market growth up to 2030. Next slide. So you would think with all this interest, multi-billion dollar industry, you know, why is everyone not using these products and why in healthcare is this not a common topic that we discuss? Well, there are a few problems that we'll define here. One being that sexual health goals are different for every person. So, you know, we like to recommend uh, one or two products, right? That makes our jobs easier as healthcare providers. If we can say, oh, this is, you know, a really good vacuum pump, or this is a really good traction device, or this is a really good medication. But you'll see, I mean, there are um, hundreds of different types of products. And so that can make it both overwhelming for patients and providers when it comes to just a place to start. 
The other problem is that common chronic conditions are associated with sexual dysfunction. So it's not even about which products we can recommend that can help a person reach climax, but it might be in the setting of someone having diabetes or arthritis or wheelchair bound. Next slide. And then despite this need from patients, uh, most of us have never been taught this information. And so it oftentimes doesn't show up in our conversations with patients because when I think back to all of my education and, and think back to all of your education, where did the use of sex toys, tools, and appliances ever show up in the curriculum? You know, oftentimes, even when it comes to the genitourinary system in medical school, we get about, you know, two hours uh, in our entire curriculum. And that oftentimes is focused on, you know, very basic genitourinary concerns. It might be focused on the prostate. It might be focused on, you know, the kidney and bladder. But rarely do we even get sexual health, in, you know, information in our training, uh, let alone discussion of these products. So it doesn't, we haven't been taught how to do it. Um, but our patients are interested. Next slide. So now the fun part of this discussion, we're going to talk about solutions because I don't want to just complain about the problem. We're going to talk about how we can fix it. And I have a lot of different products here and I'll go through some of these just to provide some guidance on where each of these devices might play a role. And when I think about all of you, you know, as audience members, I'm really thinking about it as how these devices can even help you can help your partners, can help your patients, your friends. So everyone here really is um, can benefit from these products too. You know, another piece of this problem is that we don't have a lot of research, and um, I'm sure a lot of us on this on this call are you know looking at PubMed and and various uh, resources to look at. Well, what does the evidence say? And so that's another issue is we don't have a lot of evidence to that really looks at these products. And if you go online and you look at the different product websites, there are a lot of claims out there. There are a lot of claims that, you know, uh, people are satisfied, partners are satisfied, but there are no links to any research studies. And so that creates a problem uh, for a lot of us who really practice evidence-based medicine. But the reality is while we're, and, and the, the great thing is that there's a lot of interest within the scientific community now to do studies, okay? But we don't have to wait until those studies are published to start talking about these topics. And simply if we use, you know, ourselves and, you know, um, try these products ourselves, have our partners try it, have our friends try it. Sometimes you only need one or two people to say, I like this product, it helped it helped me with that. And, and folks, that can be enough sometimes for us to talk to our patients about that. So this top product here on the left is one that can mimic oral sex. So you think about some patients who might have some hygiene issues or, you know, as people get older, or maybe their partners don't enjoy giving oral sex, but let's say the person enjoys receiving oral sex. These products right here can help mimic that. This is a water slide. This is second uh, from the left here in the middle. So this device right here can direct water from the faucet directly to the genital tissue and can be very helpful for people who let's say, you know, need help with hygiene, who let's say have decreased hand dexterity um, and can't self-pleasure themselves. Um, it can be for people who let's say don't feel comfortable or feel like it might be a dirty thing to touch themselves. This can help direct water exactly where they want it. This device right here on the right in the middle is called a clitoral suction device. And that's a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't actually suck on the tissue, but this devices like this can be helpful for uh, women who let's say are unable to reach orgasm despite using vibrators. Uh, that's where they can particularly play a role. And then we think about, you know, summertime and people traveling. Um, and if you use like a magic wand like this, they're, you know, a little bit larger and, and heavier. So it might be more difficult to travel with. But if you think about smaller devices that you could easily travel with, or, you know, if you go on a date and you keep it, you know, in a bag or a purse, these are finger vibes. And so um, these can be easily used to improve sensation. Think about, you know, some of our patients who are diabetic, uh, who might have issues and really decreased sensation is a common concern concern that I see, you know, we think about sexual dysfunction in men, and we oftentimes go right to erectile dysfunction, but a lot of these, these guys actually just have reduced sensation. So thinking creatively, how we can uh, increase sensation can be very helpful. And even though, you know, a lot of the pictures on this slide, you would think are for vagina owners only, all of these devices can also be used uh, for penis owners. 
And then this device right here, top right, you can actually mount it. So you think about someone who, let's say, um, you know, let's say a person gets home from work, they're tired, they don't want to put in any effort, but they still want to experience pleasure and just lay back and relax. Okay. So a device like this that you mount can be helpful. Or again, going to that person who might have decreased dexterity and really can't use their hands, devices like this can really uh play a role. And then we have a lot of different couple solutions. So um, this device right here on the right at the bottom, uh, you can insert into the vagina, it vibrates, you can also have uh, intercourse with this and it can vibrate on uh, the partner as well. And it can be uh, controlled remotely. So we think about a lot of our patients who are people who want to optimize spontaneity, and there are ways uh, that you can do it or, you know, different role playing situations with kind of control, and the partner can control the other person pleasure, which, you know, for some couples can, can bring in some excitement. Next slide, please. And then we'll talk about some objects here that can be used for, for penis owners. And at the top left right here, uh, we have a strap on dildo, which sounds like a little bit of a scary term and maybe something that is, you know, spoken about in pornography. Um, but recent research out of Canada, um, is showing that people actually prefer that we change our terminology a little bit. So especially for people who are showing up to see us in the healthcare setting, our terminology matters. And if we change our terminology to say something like an external penile prosthesis, uh, that you know might sit uh, better with some of our patients. And, and that's really what this is right here. So you think about some indications where this could be helpful with our patient population. So one could be, you know, a lot of guys want a bigger penis and depending on certain positions, it might be necessary for that person to engage in a certain, you know, position to have a bigger penis. Um, but there aren't great ways uh, medically or surgically to provide that for the patient. But this one right here, he can customize, you know, what he wants his penis size to be, have his actual penis down below. And so his partner can stimulate his penis to experience pleasure. His penis doesn't have to be erect or penetrating to receive pleasure. And then, you know, they can customize this strap on part right here. Um, this is a, a flashlight right here. And so you can think about, you know, going back to people who let's say don't have partners, or you think about the couple who has, let's say discrepant libidos. And it doesn't mean that just because the two people in a relationship don't want to engage in sexual activity at the same time, you know, a certain number of times a week, you know, using these products to help that person experience pleasure can be an answer to discrepant libidos, or let's say, you know, the partner, um, is just, let's say, not interested, but the male partner likes to penetrate, you know, inside the vagina. This is a great option to help mimic that. And for men who, let's say, have reduced sensation, because this can fit tighter around the penis, that can help with those guys who have sensation issues. And then this product right here is specifically called the hot octopus. It's a sleeve that goes around the penis and it vibrates. So I've used products like this or have recommended them in patients who have decreased sensation, even guys who have uh, penile implants in place to help with their pleasure. And I've had great feedback. Next slide, please. And then we also have to consider that pleasure is not just experienced within the penis, the vagina and vulva and clitoris but also uh, we have to think about anal considerations. And you know, if we take sexual orientation out of it because where we experience pleasure has nothing to do um, with our sexual orientation and who we're attracted to, you know, we just go back to basic anatomy and basic neuroanatomy. And the pudendal nerve gives sensation to all these areas, including the area around the rectum. And so these considerations right here, like a pelvic wand that we commonly use for uh, trigger points and uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, we can also use those to help people experience pleasure and then different flared base products right here to help stimulate that rectal area. Next slide, please. And then we also have positional devices. This at the bottom right here is something that can be used for someone who let's say is wheelchair bound. We have different uh, swing devices that can help open up the legs and um, help for people who let's say, you know, have issues with balance or standing, and then lots of different wedges. And the beauty about all these products is that 
they don't need a prescription. Um, and so people can just go online and purchase these products. And I think an important thing that we have to, you know, talk about with our patients and people we know is that the first product they get may not be the best product, but the beauty of these is they can try a lot of different ones to see what works best for them. And so you can see with all these different options that really for anyone who wants to experience pleasure, there is a way that every single living being can experience pleasure if we get a little creative. Next slide, please. We are part of the solution. We are actually a critical part of the solution here. And a lot of the people that we see in our offices, a lot of us are sexual medicine specialists, discussing these products plays a role in our practice. And if we can help make these conversations very normal, very vanilla conversations, uh, we can really help our patients buy in and actually purchase these products. Next slide, please. What's next is so exciting. We think about wearable devices. We think about all these technologies that we use on a regular basis to better understand our sleep and our movement and our nutrition and diet and weight. And what is up and coming is wearable devices for sexual health. So this is one of the products that I'm on the medical advisory board for the firm tech device. It's a penile constriction band. It has a sensor on it. Guys can wear it all night long and during sexual activity. And in real time, the information will go to their smartphone and tell that person how many erections they got overnight, how long they lasted and how firm he got. And there are iterations that are coming out for the female side as well. So before there's erectile dysfunction, there's erectile fitness, these wearable devices give people control and insight and knowledge into their own health. A lot of these topics, sleep, exercise, diet, don't necessarily need to be discussed, you know, all the time in the medical office or when our patients come in for a 15 minute visit, there's no way we can learn everything about their daily habits. And these wearable devices will give people more objective information about their sexual health. Very exciting. Next slide. And then also what's next is sex bots and virtual reality and the use of artificial intelligence and smart sex toys. And, and I know some of these terms might sound scary to some folks and oh, what, what is you know AI, what role is that gonna have? But the reality is all of these technologies present incredible opportunities for us in sexual medicine. And they present incredible opportunities for us to talk to our patients about what it means to really optimize their sexual lives. This cutting edge technology and these innovative products are really the future of sexual medicine. And it really is in our best interest to learn as much as we can about it. Because if we think about you know, all these areas of research that we can get into that are, you know, areas of, of medicine that are really interesting to patients. Wow. Is that an opportunity for us to really engage with people that we see in our office? Next slide, please. When it comes to the take-home points, if you learn anything from this session, I want you to take home these following topics. So we can tell this is a billion dollar industry. People are interested. There are so many opportunities to optimize sexual wellness, but not even sexual wellness. We can optimize sexual health concerns, things that people see us in the clinic all the time for with these appliances and us understanding the use, the utility, the efficacy, where these devices play a role when it comes to sexual health of our patients is critical to help our patients feel more comfortable and to help normalize the topic. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. That was so exciting and I am I cannot wait for the future of all these devices. And uh, right now we have Dr. Elna Rudolph who is the president of the World Association of Sexual Health and only the second woman and the first person from Africa to serve in this role. She's a South African medical doctor in clinical practice and has been working exclusively in sexual medicine for over a decade. Dr. Rudolph did her postgraduate training through the University of Sydney in Australia. She has been a member of the ISSM for many years and enjoys her role as WAS, uh, where the multidisciplinary approach to sexual health is realized through professional education, research, and advocacy to ensure sexual health, rights, justice, and pleasure for all. 
So with this, I leave you with Dr. Rudolph in Continental Variations in Sex Toys, Causes and Futures Perspectives. Dr. Rudolph. Thank you, Tanjanika, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. We can go to the next slide, please. So I'm the co-owner of My Sexual Health. It is a sexual health store in South Africa, just as a disclosure. Next slide. The main purpose of sex toys globally is sexual pleasure. And sexual pleasure is political and it's extremely important. International comparative research has consistently shown that diverse forms of sexual pleasure improve individual happiness and overall health. But it also improves relationships and it contributes to the health of individuals, the couples, the families, and the whole community. So sex toys can actually change the world. It's important that sex toys, wearables, and devices are available globally. And I'll show you why now. Next slide. We think that it is so important that um, it is actually part of a human right. Sexual pleasure is a fundamental part of sexual rights, which is a human right. And at the World Association for Sexual Health, we have a whole declaration of sexual rights. And many of those rights actually pertain to the availability of sex toys globally. And as you can see, our slogan is, it is actually our official slogan is sexual health and rights for all. But in this administration, we are focused on pleasure and justice. And pleasure and justice are actually quite closely linked. Next slide. So we put together a panel of consultants in 2019. And then next slide, produced a declaration on sexual rights, uh, uh, sexual pleasure, sorry. This was the follow-up declaration. And you can Google this, the War Sexual Pleasure Declaration, and read it. And it's really a beautiful declaration. I would love to read it to you now as if it is a piece of erotic literature or poetry, but I can't. There's no time. But it basically talks to all of us as healthcare providers calling us on focusing on sexual pleasure in our clinical interactions with patients on an ethical, in an ethical way, but then also definitely calling governments to make sure that people do have access to sexual pleasure. Next slide. And last year on World Sexual Health Day, which is on the 4th of September every year, I invite you to join us this year and celebrate World Sexual Health Day with us. It's on consent this year. But last year, we our theme was Let's Talk Pleasure. And next slide, you will see that even the WHO participated in this. And the WHO produced beautiful uh, research on if you include pleasure into sex education, um, that there is actually better outcomes. So pleasure is no longer this dark place that is in this dingy sex shop hidden, hidden somewhere. It's actually really getting onto the global agenda. And sex toys play an important role in giving people the ability or enhancing people's ability to experience pleasure. Of course, Millions, probably billions of people around the globe experience sexual pleasure without the help of any toys and aids. But the thing is, if they need it, they should have the right to access it. Next slide. And not all individuals have equal opportunity to experience sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is a given for men. And if I say that, obviously not all men um, experience sexual pleasure and not but 95 percent of them seem to experience sexual pleasure and 65 percent of women only with only 25 to 30 percent of women regularly orgasming from from pino vaginal sex whereas 90 percent of men do so if our perception is sex is something where a penis goes into a vagina and it moves in and out and that thing gives both people sexual pleasure we are wrong if we as healthcare providers think that that is pleasurable sex we are wrong because the evidence show that yes most men but not all men get pleasure from that and really not all women one large American survey also showed that 30% of women said that they had pain during their last sexual interaction. That's massive, one in three. And only 5% of men said that, but that's also quite a lot. Why did, why did one in 20 men have pain during their last sexual interaction? Unless, of course, they asked for it and it was under very controlled, consensual circumstances. 
In many countries, only problems that interfere with men's sexual pleasure or procreation are reported. If you think, I remember going to the ISSM Congress in China, and there's all these amazing andrologists and the, all these fantastic fertility clinics, but where are all the female sexual dysfunction clinics? I hope. I haven't been there in a few years. It's now full of female sexual dysfunction clinics. But generally, that's also what I see as a South African, that people report sexual problems if it is interfering with men's pleasure and men's ability to perform. It's as if women do not even have the right to complain about their lack of sexual pleasure. Of course, it's not for everyone. I've got a whole full clinic of female sexual dysfunction, but... Um, there are many areas in the world where a woman's pleasure is really not put on the table. And then very limited research on sexual pleasure in general, but especially in the LGBTQIA communities. Next. So there's a fantastic paper, and I invite all of you to read this paper. It is open source in the International Journal of Sexual Health, In Pursuit of Pleasure, a Biopsychosocial Perspective on Sexual Pleasure and Gender. It was written by um, Ellen Lahn and colleagues. Ellen was a very famous sexologist from the Netherlands that passed away recently. But this is a beautiful, beautiful article about sexual pleasure and the pleasure gap, particularly. You can go to the next slide. Um, and it says that sexual activity in most cultures is less pleasurable and associated with greater cost for women than for men, even if they do not differ in their capacity to experience pleasure. Women have just as much capacity to experience pleasure as men. We are not created um, with less capacity for pleasure, but the pleasure gap is not biological. We need to remove the restrictions from women's opportunities for pleasure that will be the basis for gender equality and an enabling factor for sexual justice. And you know what? Uh, I mean, this might sound very feminist, but the reality is if it is a heterosexual couple where there's a man and a woman, um, if we look at the research, a major contributor to men's sexual pleasure is also the fact that the woman experiences pleasure. Most couples want to be in an interaction, doesn't matter whether it is a trans, non-binary person, what their sexual orientation is, they want to be in a sexual interaction where the other person is actually also enjoying the interaction. And sex toys and aids and wearables can actually play a big role in this. So removing restrictions to sex toys and sexual age is a protection of human rights and an act of justice. Next slide. So what are these restrictions? The Probably the biggest restriction restriction is the societal norms, because societal norms until this day influences government laws and policies. Many societies, there's the notion that seeking the seeking of sexual pleasure is in itself dangerous and destructive and a negative force that will lead to societal chaos and anarchy. So sex toys can be seen as the enemy of government, you know, who do not practice evidence-based uh, policymaking. They think for some reason, we now have sex toys available in our country, it is going to lead to total chaos. Believe me, I live in a country where sex toys are freely available and there are many, many other reasons for the total, total chaos that we find ourselves in. Um, but there is this notion, you know, you always want to hook problems onto something. And uh, honestly, from the evidence, we know that it does not cause anarchy. For centuries, medicine and psychiatry also contributed to this notion by advocating for any sex other than sex for procreational purposes as being unhealthy and posing a risk for the stability of individuals and societies. And women are often socialized to put the needs of the partners first and not to insist on the experience of their own pleasure. So these societal norms uh, make it difficult for some countries to access sex toys. Next. Just to give you an example, last year I traveled all over the world to go and visit the wars federations. This was in Malaysia in the Asia of um, Oceania region. And there you see, this is a panel on sexual justice, two women there. Um, and this was what was displayed at the, you know, in the exhibition area, all of you have attended sexual health conferences and you know that what the exhibition areas look like. This was displayed there. And this is modesty wear for a woman that is go going into labor. So she wears these pants and then this flap that you see there in front is what the doctor then opens to deliver the, pap uh, the, the baby in order to protect her 
modesty. So um, the next slide, this was in South Africa. And here at least there's a brand of, um, you, you know, these people sell lubricants and all kinds of other things and they, um, or at the exhibition at the South African Congress. And then at the next slide, this is in Miami. And here you can actually see actual penis displayed in the exhibition area and this massive penis pump displayed in the exhibition area. So that would never have happened at that Congress in Malaysia because the government there perceives a phallic object like that penis as something that actually poses a threat to the health of society. Whereas we know from the evidence that the health of society is influenced by uh, many things, of course, but sexual well-being is actually something that influences the health of societies and sex toys contributes to that and does not actually take away from that. Next slide. So religious norms, 84% of the globe as population identifies with the religious groups and the biggest groups, 55% of the globe is either Christian and Muslim or Jewish. And within these religions, um, there's a strong uh, prohibition on masturbation and sex toys. Some do allow it with discretionary use, but there's this notion of it being sin. And of course, then how can you, how can I as a woman of faith sell products that cause people to sin. There's a very strong notion about this. And in Africa, so many people are religious. And, you know, in the global South, you have a very, very big community of religious people. So there's massive pushback, pushbacks against the use of sex toys. So next slide. And um, then there are countries in the world where it is completely just illegal, completely illegal. You can go to jail for selling it. Mauritius, uh, for instance, the United Arab Emirates, Maldives, Thailand, Saudi, Vietnam, and, and Kuwait. And I see we've got people from Mauritius and Vietnam here. Yeah, maybe you can tell us in the chat if, if it is in fact like that. Do you have any sex stores there? Is it maybe not policed that much? But um, theoretically, it's unlawful. In Africa, the laws around sex toys are sometimes very confusing. And like in Zimbabwe, there is now a sex store, but the the government actually has to give very, very particular um, permission for this to, to happen. And sometimes it's just not police, but you never know that you might get into trouble. The problem is that if you travel to the Maldives with your sex toy, you can get into serious trouble, even be jailed for it. Did you know that? I traveled to Botswana to go and do a lecture with my normal stuff. And this was not for medical doctors. It was for the general public. So, you know, I always have a few things with me. And I didn't know that I'm bringing these things into the country illegally. So be careful of that. Next slide. Um, then we have serious restrictions in terms of the censoring, and this is a, a big problem for me, that on Facebook and Instagram, they just have this blanket statement to say that uh, it must be not focused on sexual pleasure, and I think that's against human rights, because of course, we don't want to sexualize children. I'm a mother of a four and a six-year-old. The last thing that I want to do is to sexualize my children. I do not want pictures of penis pumps um, on every billboard on the way to school. Definitely not. But if an adult opts in for information about sexual pleasure on a social network, they have the right to do so. So this is a fight that I'll, I'll start fighting at some point. It's definitely part of the war theory of change to change the, so that all information about sexual pleasure is not censored because there's evidence to show if people have better information about sexual pleasure, they make better choices and they are better protected actually. Next slide. The other restrictions, um, Oh, the, the, this is an infringement on their rights to information, access to scientific progress, and actually sexual health, well-being, and pleasure. And the other problem is that in a country like Africa, the it, it has a restriction on our ability to earn a living. Because if you feel that you want to make sex toys available, there's no massive chain in your country. People can't go to into every suburb and find a sex shop. You want to do your own little business. Everyone else that sells things sells it on Facebook and Instagram, but you can't because it's a product for sexual pleasure. And that's also a form of discrimination, actually. Next slide. So financial restrictions. In South Africa, for instance, 25% of people experience food poverty poverty. They do not have enough money to buy food. So talking to them about a sex toy is impossible. I worked in a 
sexual health clinic in the government set up for a while. And of all the patients that I saw in that over a two year period, not one patient, not a single patient was able to go and purchase even a water-based lubricant. They did not have the money for that. So let me just uh, show you something. A silicone lubricant um, like this, it will take a person two days work to buy a bottle of a silicone lube. A water-based lubricant like this one, it's a big bottle of water-based lube, but it's at least a half day's labor. A full set of vaginal dilators is a half a month's earnings and a high-end vibrator um, like the one that uh, the ones that Amy spoke about. I've got this one here, for instance. And of course, these are not product endorsements. Uh, I just wanted to show you. But this kind of uh, device that can have clitoral suctioning as well as um, G-spot stimulation, this is almost two months of earning for a person living in South Africa. Now, obviously not everyone, but if you are um, lucky enough to have a job, every person with a job in South Africa supports three to four other people. So you might think, um, you know, buying, using half a day's wage to buy a lube is not that bad, but that half a day's lube has to buy food for three or four other people as well. So it's just not that easy to access products for people from poor countries. In the rest of Africa, 85% of people live on less than $5 a day. And the cheapest product in our store, um, which is something like this. And if you ask the, the um, all these commercial sex shops, they will tell you that this is the best seller. All over the world, a tiny little vibrator like that it works fantastic for anorgasmia. This is what I suggest for all my patients who can't orgasm. Just buy a cheap entry-level vibrator, put it onto the clitoris, and you um, are much, much more likely to orgasm from that stimulation than from manual stimulation. But it's not accessible for people to buy even the cheapest product on the store. So many people have no means to invest in sexual toys or aids. Next one. Um, is uh, the starting a sexual health shop or sex toy business requires a significant amount of capital in a field where sex sells, but it is still severely stigmatized. When I started my practice, I um, wanted to tell the patient with sexual pain, listen, you need a silicone lubricant, but actually to use with your vaginal dilators, you also need a, a water-based lubricant. Then um, you get those two from two different places. Then you need to buy a set of vaginal dilators. And then you also might need a little vibrator for clitoral stimulation. All of those things are from different shops. Now you need to go online, find all of that, order it, pay, and, and that was actually in the years before uh, these online shops were everywhere, and um, pay for all of the courier fees as well. And then I'm also going to prescribe you various medications. You need to see the physiotherapist, et cetera, et cetera. So I just realized this is not going to work. Uh, patients are non-compliant. So I set up a separate sexual health shop in my practice where patients could then purchase that. But it's been running for six years and um, it's subsidized by my practice. And I have to have multiple employees. I've got 10 different suppliers. I have to manage hundred different things on the stock list. I never made money out of this thing. It just takes a lot of my time. But for me as a clinician, I am really struggling to help my patients if I don't have the sexual aids available for them right there. It can be highly unethical if I'm trying to sell a sex toy to everyone that walks through my door, definitely. But there is this balance between rendering a good service to your patient, making these things accessible uh, for them so that they can, they can have access to them to improve their sex life and um, you know just trying to make money off your patients. So next slide. Uh, the logistics for patients is a lack of sex and sexual health shops online or on site in many countries in the world. Still sex shops don't sell sexual health aids. So I'll just show you some of the sexual health aids. These are by far the best sellers in, in, in our setup. It is like a tiny little vaginal dilator like this going up to, this is in size five. Um, and then we go up to size eight as well, but most men are slightly smaller than this size. By far the product that sells most from our shop. Then there's things like a penis pump. Now, if you look at what a typical penis pump looks like, it looks like this. 
this is something that you might not want to have in your house because if your child sees it, it's a big problem. So you might rather want to have a product like this, a tiny little pump that is actually extendable that you might travel with. It doesn't look as phallic if you travel with it because it looks like just a little cup. And if your child finds it, it doesn't look as obscure. We have a wearable um, like this. So the wearables are not only the external penis prosthesis, but this is actually a, just a packer that our trans men like to wear. And um, I'm just looking at all of my goodies. Look at this. This is a, so the vaginal dilators, and then these are anal dilators for anal play. These are things that are sexual health products that you will not necessarily find in an ordinary sex shop. And the person that works at the sex shop isn't trained to actually take you through this whole process of preparing for anal sex, for instance, with something like this. Uh, and that's a barrier. Sex shops um, are often not the kind of establishments so that patients who access sexual health services want to frequent, you know. They, they think that, oh, no, that's, the erotica, which it sometimes is, and sometimes you've got amazing sex shops uh, here in South Africa, I know of a few, but people don't necessarily want to access it. And then you might need to go to multiple establishments, as I've explained. You can go to the next slide. So you need import license, supplier accounts, warehousing and storage, dispensing. You know, someone needs to actually find the right product for the patient and then give it to them. And if it's not the doctor, the doctor in South Africa isn't allowed to have the products in their room. It needs to be a separate, separate place. So it's not always practical for me to go around and give it. So I need to employ someone that does that. It needs to be packaged. There's often faulty stock. Stock expires. The stock levels needs to be managed. It's a massive issue to actually just have these things available for our patients. Next slide. But I do it with love and joy, I tell you, because I've seen the difference that it makes for patients. There are ethical boundaries. In many countries, healthcare providers are not allowed at all to be involved in the selling of any health-related products. In South Africa, it needs to be a separate facility and not the doctor's practice and with a separate, a separate entity that's registered. No promotion of products by a healthcare provider is allowed. You cannot go onto the internet and say, I think this is the best and this is why I think this is the best and um, I promote this product. Of course, you can do something educational like what we're doing here where you... It's just educational, but please, as a healthcare provider globally, um, don't associate, associate yourself strongly with um, brands. You can you can do educational work for them, but don't put your name to it because um, it is difficult for patients to discern where um, you know if if healthcare providers are powerful. That's basically the point. So um, and and in South Africa, we're not allowed to be involved in the manufacturing of any products and an awareness of prefers incentives to the healthcare provider in this uh, when suggestions are made is what I've mentioned. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the future perspectives, what I would love to see, and that's why I'm involved with the World Association for Sexual Health, where we try and change the global climate, uh, climate, climate. <laughs> I almost said climax climate in um, sexual health and rights. So um, with scientific rights and evidence-based, experience-informed, context-sensitive information, rather than myths and misconceptions. So we don't go into India with penises on every billboard. It's not context-sensitive, but we speak to the government to try and make it at least legal to sell the products. Because you know, wherever it's illegal, it's sold on the black market anyway, but then people aren't protected. So do legal reform based on research and not preconceived ideas give people access to better information about the availability of products? Do capacity building for small business owners in the global south so that these products get available in the global south? Make sexual health aids available to patients through state facilities. I worked in a state facility with not a single sexual health product available to patients, uh, only in private. And then improve gender inequality through narrowing the gender gap. Okay, so my take home message. Healthcare providers should follow the placid model and advise patients on the use of sex toys and aids, exactly like what Amy said. So I'll just briefly explain to you how to do that. Next slide. In permission, you give patients permission to use sexual toys and aids and to discuss any queries they have with you. Don't be too fancy and too academic to answer your patients' questions. Give them information. Give them access to information about a wide range of sex toys, aids, and wearables that are available in your country. 
I had an incident this week where the patient went to a pelvic health physio in Dubai and she told her to get um, vaginal dilators and it is just impossible. She ordered them, they got stopped at, cus at customs, they cannot get it. So um, it doesn't help to tell patients about these wonderful things if your patient sitting in front of you does not have access to it. Next slide. Specific suggestions, you give the patient the specific suggestions for the products that might work for them. My vaginismus patient gets suggested to use vaginal dilators, for instance, and exact instructions on how to use it for them and how to access it. And then intensive therapy refers to those that you will refer who need specialist advice that you cannot give because all of us aren't experts. So, for instance, on... Um, the amazing, massive, multi-billion industry around kink. I'm not a great expert on that. I'll refer to one of my colleagues that knows a lot about that. Or out of control sexual behavior or specialist uh, specialized needs like certain mobility stuff. We've got occupational therapists on our team that can help with the um, mobility stuff and other medical conditions. So with that, I conclude my talk and I will be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rudolph. That was a very exciting, very exciting presentation. And uh, uh, it makes uh, this topic very complex and complicated all over the world as we saw the differences between Amy's uh, presentation and Elna's presentation. Now we do have some questions from the audience. So number one, Dr. Elna, do sex toys affect couples' sex life? <laughs> you know, um... I have very seldom, as a person who sees people with sexual dysfunction all the time, um, told a couple that you as a couple must buy a sex toy. But look, I'm not focused on couple therapy at all. I'm a doctor and I sort out individual sexual dysfunction. So um, I think that, for instance, a woman with anorgasmia influences that influences the couple. So she comes to me, I help her with a tiny little vibrator that in our um, life in South Africa is usually context sensitive enough. It's not this penis. It doesn't look like it's going to replace the partner's penis. Um, and we just start with that. And then she learns to achieve an or, or to experience an orgasm rather and the, on her own first. And then we involve the couple, the, the partner in that. And then eventually the partner learns to give her, uh, I also don't like that word to give her an orgasm, but then they learn to experience an orgasm together. And so for me, that's extremely positive for the couple. But I started focusing on the on the women who had the sexual dysfunction initially. Um, will it help if a couple's um, relationship is really in trouble? If there's a lot of resentment between them, if they're communicating poor, um, poorly, to just go and buy a very expensive vibrator, unlikely. But can it add to pleasure? just to pleasure, just to that moment of pleasure, certainly. And then we know that that moment of pleasure improves the relationship, um, which improves family life, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I think it can be great for couples. Of course, you do have the incidences where the one partner feels very threatened by the sex toy. But I think through education, we can change a lot of that as well. Thank you very much for that answer. I think that's very helpful and ties into another uh, rather comment that was uh, included in the, in the Q&A section. And it's that in Turkey, the main problem is that men see sex toys as a competitive element. So you have explained how we can incorporate this without that uh, uh, being a problem. Um, so we only have a few minutes for some more questions. Um, and so there's quite a few here. And thank you so much. I don't know, Estella, if you would like to address the next question. Yes, please. Uh, there was a question for Dr. Perman regarding the cost that you already answered somehow. And I would like to also add to the question something that happens, as I see in the chat in many countries, regarding the fact that some products are illegal and that other products might be unsafe so besides the cost of the product I, I would like to highlight and ask for your opinion about the safety right because maybe you can find some other like um, handmade uh, solutions but it is important for people to know that those products might be might be dangerous for them 
Yeah. And I think part of it too, with a lot of these products that are on the market is we don't really know how any of them are tested. And even if something is marketed as a, you know, sex product on a website, it still might not be a safe product for someone. At the end of the day, the material matters, you know, the lubrication that's, that can be used with these products matters. And so people really need to read on the website in terms of how do I clean this device so that STIs don't get spread. That's really important. And um, someone else had mentioned about use of, you know, different household products. So even if like a vibrating toothbrush or sitting on the washer, right, there are actually lower cost products that are not necessarily marketed as sex toys. We don't know, you know, if we talk about a vibrating toothbrush, has there been a study to show the safety of that on a part of the genitals? No, there hasn't, right? But there's risks and benefits of everything. And, and I think that's also an area ripe for research. Why don't we study that question? Why don't we study the safety of these household products that can be used that are legal? Think about other objects that resemble these products too, a massager, right? That looks very much like the magic wand vibrator. So we can use a lot of these things that are still easily accessible and, and not illegal for sexual pleasure. And that's just another place where we can get creative. The other thing too, when it comes to these products is if it hurts or someone doesn't like it, that's indication to stop using it and to try something else. But it's really the first product we get is not gonna be the only product. And that's really in life. The first toothbrush we get, the first detergent we get, the first deodorant we get, toilet paper, is oftentimes one of many that we will try throughout our lifetime. Um, yes. So th thank you so much for that answer. Um, I think we are coming uh, to the top of the hour. Um, this has been such an exciting presentation. And so I would like to hand it over to Dr. Rahim. Thank you so much for participating um, and having all these interesting questions. And thank you so much for the presenters. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, before we close, uh, Amy and Elena, I should have a question for you, because as you know, I see a lot of men with uh, young men with sexual problems. Uh, and oftentimes those young men may be addict addicted or maybe experienced pornography before. So and then they now they have a new partner. And I find myself really stuck in with these patients because I want to disconnect them from what they've been experienced before on pornography and then and feeling or maybe encountering a real life situation with their partners. So what's your thoughts here on if, if sex toys obviously has wonderful, I mean, you, you highlighted great things about sex toys and applications and clinical usage, use and all that. Do you think we're gonna um, be in a situation where those young men or young um, individuals or young uh, you know, uh, females um, using sex toys uh, when, they really, when they get into a real relationship, for example, with their, with their partners? Are they going to have some disconnect between what they've been used to in terms of sex, sex toys use and then real life? Or are we going to, this going to uh, help and, 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 and augment their, their sexual desire and, and pleasure? Elena, do you want to start? <laughs> Look, this is the topic for a whole webinar. Um, and I'm not a psychosexual therapist. So this is work that needs to be done over a long time. If there is just pornography use, we know it's not harmful. But if there is a pornography addiction and some of the notions from pornography can be extremely harmful. Um, and it takes time to shift perceptions around that. But I really believe that if couples enter into every interaction with the idea that we want to have a sexually, sexually pleasurable experience shared amongst equals, sex toys is a great addiction to that. And they're used as an adjunct. They're not a replacement. We put so much pressure on ourselves to pleasure ourselves and our partners over our lifetimes. Why do we do that? If I think about making dinner and I want to make spiraled spaghetti from zucchini, do I do that one by one? I do not. I buy it either pre-made and pre-packaged or I get a spiraler machine. That is the same thing. We are making it easier to experience incredible pleasure. And at the end of the day, what I want to do with a partner is I want them to feel really good, but I also don't want it to take out every ounce of energy that I have. And that's where these products can play a role. They are not for everyone. I have plenty of male patients who have tried these products and they say, they're not for me. That's great. 
they don't need to use them. They're just another tool in the toolbox. Great answers. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah, now I think we are coming to an end. I'm not sure if there's any other comments from the moderators, uh, Stella or uh, Angita, do you have any questions or any comments? Okay, I guess we're gonna move to the last slide of the webinar today. Uh, Lillian, can you put that slide please? So I want to announce the uh, upcoming uh, exciting webinar, another wonderful one in, on uh, June 27th uh, at 6.30 p.m. UTC. Uh, this will be on vaginismus. Um, There's going to be a joint webinar between SSM and the Middle East Society of Sexual Medicine. So please tune in, uh, register. Uh, we'd love to see you there and um, have a wonderful uh, day, everybody. Thank you for attending.